Welcome, welcome everybody. We'll be talking about advanced digital strategies, um, specifically AI and emerging technologies and marketing. Um, this is typical of some of the course curriculum and content that we have at the Wharton Online Program. And so this is gonna give you a little bit of a taste of the types of things that we cover in that experience and in that course. And we'll tell you more about that too at the end of the webinar. So my name is Sharon Lee Tony. I am a program mentor for the Wharton Online Program. I'm also a Wharton Executive MBA um, alumni. I, uh, I run a digital marketing agency called SLT Consulting. We've been around for about five years, and I started it after a pretty long career working in marketing overall as a practitioner. Here's what we are going to be doing um, in today's session. I'll talk you guys through the role of AI, artificial intelligence, and marketing talk you guys through some applications of it in marketing and how a lot of brands and companies are using it today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about machine learning and how that's being applied, how that's being leveraged, um, and you know how, how folks are really taking advantage of the new opportunities available to them. Um, we'll also talk through um, ethical considerations. In terms of AI, there's a lot of you know discussion around what is... Um, What's ethical? What isn't ethical? What are the types of guardrails we should be setting around AI and marketing? Um, I'll take you through a couple of case studies. I think I have three of them prepared for you. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. But as I mentioned, at any time, feel free to just post your questions um, in the Q&A and I will, I'll, I'll dip in every now and then to, uh, to take a look at those. So let's get started. And thank you guys for continuing to post in the chat where you're from, what you're doing, what you're all about, because um, that's a great way for us to all connect. So when it comes to AI in marketing, what the platforms are doing and what apps are doing is it's using things like pretty advanced algorithms and machine learning to automate processes and to optimize processes. So I gave you guys the example of an AI note taker, right? And when you think about that, all it's really doing, not all, but basically what it's doing is it's recording the audio of a meeting. And sometimes certain platforms also record the video. And then it's taking, it's taking that file and it's making connections based on based on behaviors that it's that it's familiarized itself with, based on some keywords that it's picking up over and over again, um, based on other things that it's been programmed to to cue um, certain things. So for example, when it comes to writing up next steps, the platform is listening, quote unquote listening, or recording the conversation and finding keywords like th that would indicate decisions that a group is making, right? That would indicate timeframes that the folks are agreeing on. That would indicate delegation of duties and then summarizing that in a way that then makes sense for a human to look at and to, and to utilize into action. So even though, I mean, so these are robots and we call it, you know, we're talking about the robots taking over the world and other things like that. But what it is, is it's really the algorithms that are picking things up. And as these technologies become more familiar to how you're, you're using them personally, how your company might be using them, how an app is using them across its users, it's learning how to be smarter. It's optimizing. So one thing that I've learned about our own AI note taker is we use acronyms all the time, just like any business would, right? So certain clients are acronymed a certain way. Um, we use acronyms like KPIs all of the time. We use just all sorts of terminology. And in the beginning, it was like taking those acronyms and trying to spell it out like a word. And then as we went in and edited that ourselves, so we'd go in and like, you know, maybe... KPI was always KPI, but I can't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But as things were being adjusted by a human, the platform automatically started to learn that. Like, okay, so when we say PJAN, which for us stands for the P&G Alumni Network, which is one of our clients, we're not talking about a jam. We're not talking about P's and JANs. We're not like, you know, PJAN is a client. And so it, start, it starts to learn that and it starts to then provide a more personalized experience to the users. And so because we've been using this technology now for several months, it knows it's even started to associate account manager with client, right? So when certain people are on a call, account managers and project managers, it automatically knows that this one person is assigned to these types of projects and can then tailor the notes to be the types of things that this person is likely to talk about. Um, 
which is really wonderful for us as we find it really useful. Um, and therefore it also helps to provide more, more, uh, more personalized things, but from a marketing perspective allows us as marketers to offer better segmentation, to be able to tailor to customer needs, to be able to build relationships with consumers based on how they are interacting with the technology and what types of information they might be looking for in different ways. Um, we are already seeing, and we can continue to expect to see more and more people being a, using AI in different ways and to use it more effectively. I think in the beginning, a lot of us were just kind of experimenting with it in in ways where, you know, we were maybe just using it to search, like chat GPT is a big one, right? When I first started using it, I was using it as if it were Google, just kind of asking it questions. Um, way back in the day, there used to be a website called Ask Jeeves. For those of you who are from the decades that I am, you might remember Ask Jeeves, which was kind of like how, you know, eventually how we started to use Google of just asking it a bunch of questions. Now I go into chat GPT and I have full on chats um, follow-up questions and other things for ChatGPT that then kind of informs me about things too. So different ways to, to use things in different, uh, you know, in different use cases. Automation has been around for a long time and automation is a, um, a big part of AI. And it's something where, you know, we might not even be thinking about it, right? So a lot of these platforms that you see here, some of these are CRM platforms, some of these are email marketing platforms, some of these are, um, like I love Grammarly, I use, actually use that too. Some of these are, are sort of like grammar correction platforms. All of these types of platforms are ones where they're already shaping the content that we're putting out there. So if you're using a platform like MailChimp for your email marketing, then you are probably setting up something like an automated welcome email. When someone signs up for your MailChimp email list, they get an automated email that says, thanks for signing up. Thanks for joining our list. Maybe you have some information there about your brand. Maybe you're including a promo code. Just kind of depends on whatever, you know, whatever content is appropriate for your business. Those types of things are being leveraged across the board for different types of um, audiences. What's interesting about AI is that we're taking the existing automated features and AI is allowing us to become even more segmented and even more personalized, right? So that that email now, that welcome email might be more than just a standard, thanks for signing up. It might actually be um, one where you can personalize certain sections of that email to meet the needs of that one customer or consumer. So if you know that this person is interested in blue kites because you sell different kites and they happen to sign up on a page on your website where you had blue kites for sale, you can take that information, put that into, um, integrate your email platform in that way, but then use AI and automation to then personalize that message to the audience. So I, I tell you this because for those of us that feel like AI is still super innovative and maybe even out of reach for us and might not be that accessible or even a little bit scary to use, the way that we've used technology in the last few years and the way that we're already familiar with these other features is similar to how AI is being, being um, leveraged. It's really just, it, it's a way that we're just, that the, the platforms are able to offer just much more, much more personalized and much smarter ways of communicating, which is what marketers are tapping into. Hopefully that makes sense. There are different types of technologies when it comes to um, artificial intelligence, right? So there's auto, there's augmented reality, and that's basically where um, typically you're, you're, you know, there's a filter on something, or you might even have like, you know, AR kind of glasses or lenses, but it's where you're looking at the real world with digital elements overlaid on top of that. So it could be through filters. It could be through um, augmenting reality, through kind of uh, magnifying certain things um, in, in the room. It can also be, um, you know, kind of showcasing a, a digital element, a digital content, a piece of content. It could be a picture, a video, kind of in a real space that someone could be present in. So that's augmenting reality. Mixed reality is where there's um, the physical world and digital elements, but where the user can interact with that. So it's one of those things where if you're wearing uh, you know, glasses or, or there's a filter on something and you as a user go and try to poke 
you know, the digital element, it moves, right? Or it changes color or it transforms in some way. And so that's where users and real and, and I guess more real elements are then interacting with the digital elements to create that shared experience. And then there's virtual reality. And this is one that a lot of us are already quite familiar with, where you're just fully immersed. It's a, it's a digital environment. Everything's kind of, you know, all made up. It's not, you don't actually see the real room around you. Um, and, you know, here you, the, the guy's actually dancing with the robot. So you might be, you know, swimming underwater and, you know, swimming with sharks, or you might be in some other make-believe scenario, but um, you're experiencing it as, as a user, but you're just really experiencing it through what your eyes are typically perceiving and what your brain is perceiving um, versus what's actually around you. So those are the three types of AI that we're going to be talking about now, especially as you talk about how brands are using them. And I'm just going to pause for questions. I'm so glad that Gregory remembered to ask Jeeves. See? <laughs> Jeeves was very helpful. Um, and I think he even, like, the icon was like a little butler too, right, Gregory? So, like, you just felt like you were being served uh, by, by a platform. I don't see any questions yet in the chat, so that's great. Perfect. I will keep rolling. Um, so Apple Vision Pro. Um, Apple Vision Pro took a blend of digital content with physical space. And basically, it's it's a set of glasses that you are putting on. Um, you can kind of transform how you use the apps that you love. You can kind of scale things. You can use it to scale things. You can uh, use it to, like, decorate a room that you are physically in and kind of just kind of, you know, make up fake designs in your room and things like that while still being present in the space. So it's, you know, we talk about things like the rose tinted glasses, right? That's basically how this um, hardware is being used where you are sitting in a space, but you're literally, there's a lens over your eyes. Um, and based on that lens, you can control what else you can see in that space. Um, the way that uh, brands have used this is kind of interesting. So um, Patron, the tequila brand, uh, created an experience in the Apple App Store uh, where folks could plant and be in, a, in a, uh, an agave field, right? So tequila is made from blue agave. It's a specific kind of plant that's harvest, harvested and then, I don't know, processed in a way. I've never made tequila, but they distill it they or the equivalent of that. And they, 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 uh, they use that to manufacture tequila. And so you were able to plant the agave plant in a field. Um, you would then see a whole landscape of agave plants with greenery so that you, you could basically create this a similar type of hacienda that where Patron actually grew its, its uh, agave plant. So you were basically taking a space that you were in and transforming it to be the Patron field and then therefore had an immersive experience in that way. Um, and why is that fun and why is that uh, important? Because I think, you know, for, for people that really love tequila, um, those types of being closer to the ingredients is really important, right? For folks that may be big, big Patron fans and just really love the brand, they, you know, they may have always dreamed to go and visit the Hacienda or dreamed to go and actually see where these plants were being grown. And this is a way that they could be transformed virtually. Um, into this, this world and this lifestyle. So that's a mixture of AR, augmented reality, and mixed reality, because I was still taking a space that someone was physically in and then allowing people to kind of interact with that space and by interacting, you know, growing these fake plants and seeing these, these fields in that way too. Um, a more common one that I feel like a lot of us have experimented with. I don't know if you guys have. I definitely have myself when I've shopped for furniture. One thing about buying furniture online is not really knowing how it's going to look in your house, right? Everything from size to shape to color to kind of just planning out, you know, where do we put this couch or where do we put this table? Or is this even going to look right between the two windows that I have? Um, so Ikea built... Um, uh, within their app, built an AR augmented reality experience for users where you could take the item that you wanted to buy from Ikea. So here we're seeing a little red chair um, and 
take a picture of the, or, or rather, sorry, take your phone and kind of, um, you know, capture that, the capture vis visual of where you wanted to put that piece of furniture so that you could get a sense of what that would look like. It was almost like, you know, doing a mock-up of your, uh, of an interior design project for your own living room. And it, it was helpful because the way that they had built this feature was that it, it, from a scale and a size perspective, it was pretty accurate to a 3D model of the actual um, item that you were buying. So super helpful when it comes to decorating and design, but also helpful in terms of placement and, and how much space that you have so that you could really envision and really see what your rooms, what your house, what your bedroom might look like after, um, after you purchase that. And Muhammad says, Ikea Place is a great helper. Yeah, so great for planning, right? Great for making those decisions. Like, let's say you were deciding between this red chair and maybe there's like a different, a completely different style of green chair that you were deciding um, amongst. And in the past, like before all of this, like maybe you were taking your laptop and kind of like sitting it down in the corner and being like, hmm, with this product on the screen now, can I imagine this chair here? But now all you have to do is kind of, you know, take your phone and actually see it in its place. So really helpful from that perspective too. So for anyone who's thinking about redesigning, redecorating, download the Ikea Place app and you can have a great time um, and probably spend way too much money than you intended to <laughs> while doing that too. Other things um, involved in AI is the machine learning component of all of this. So as I mentioned, right, so much of this is really about constantly optimizing and constantly being able to provide the users or the, co the consumers with a really great personalized experience. And it's the machine learning component of AI that allows these platforms to do that. And basically, they're just doing it the same way that, as you guys are probably familiar with, like I mentioned, you know, it's segmentation, it's looking at customer behaviors, it's kind of learning about um, what types of content, what types of messages people are more likely to respond to. And then it's making connections over time of, you know, this person is most likely to engage with that type of product and is most likely to convert if I, if I show them these types of things. And so this helps because it's an automated optimization process. Whereas in the past, as marketers, we may have had to look at lots of data. We may have had to look through lots of qualitative things, right? Comments or testimonials or reviews to determine what would be the best way to proceed. Now, which is all being automatically captured and the algorithms are allowing for automated uh, optimization too. So ways that this is being implemented could be through things like product, optimizing product selections, or maybe optimizing pricing. For those of us who shop a lot on Amazon, you'll notice quite often that it might be whatever you're, whatever you're thinking about buying would be one price one day or even one hour. And then like half an hour later, that price often changes. I used to work in the travel industry, um, specifically in the hotel industry. And the dynamic price of there, like, you know, you can never predict it. I mean, there are people, there are human beings that actually specialize in pricing strategies for hotels and it's all very deliberate. But as a consumer and a user, um, I know I've been frustrated more than once where it's like, oh, this hotel room is going to be whatever, it might be $350, 20 minutes later, it's $380. It's like, how did that happen, right? Um, and it's happening because of dynamic pricing and optimization. So supply and demand trends, it could be happening because of the time of day. It could be happening because of the, 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 the device that you're even using and that you're on. But in this case with AI, it's actually mostly happening because of who you are as a customer. So as you're entering an app, as you're entering a website, as you're engaging with digital content, these platforms are looking at you as a user and trying to then determine what's the optimal product mix, price point, messaging, photo, video, image, you name it, that's going to uh, resonate with you most. So that's one way. Another way related to all of that too is using this to acquire new customers, right? So rather than doing all these crazy A-B tests, that would have to manually be set up or like, you know, um, analyzed later. This allows for mass scale um, with testing messaging and, and, and then appealing to new audiences. Same for retaining existing customers, right? So if someone is only shopping um, on your website and buying socks on your website, 
And that's all they ever buy. They come in time and time again, and they buy socks. They are a, a, an avid, loyal sock purchaser. Um, the content that they should see from you should be all about socks. Maybe once in a while, you might want to try to cross sell them on a pair of shoes, right? So there could be other, other ways that you leverage this too of, hmm, how do we get them from socks to more things or other things? But leveraging AI to retain existing customers is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty... It's a pretty simple one to put out there because you already have all of this data on your existing customers in terms of their purchase behavior, their frequency of purchase too. Like machine learning and AI is also being used in terms of likelihood of um, re-engagement, right? So even in Klaviyo, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, it is Klaviyo. So when you when you sync up your Klaviyo account, which is an email platform to your Shopify website, um, they have predictive analytics where if if you've got existing customers on your list, it'll actually tell you when the next time they might shop for you could be. And then you could then automate emails and promotions to that person at that time frame. Um, it's almost like having ESP and fortune telling, right? But it's all now being driven by machine learning and AI. Social media, another, you know, another way that folks are using machine learning, just kind of leveraging the algorithms of social to then deliver messages. Usually it's in advertising, um, but also from now that social commerce has become such a big thing. So people are shopping now within the Instagram um, platform, within the TikTok platform, within the, the Facebook platform. Um, those algorithms are also serving up products and content based on people's specific behavior. So if I'm logging in, the Instagram shop that I'm probably going to see for most brands is going to feature women's products. My husband might be logging in on his device, you know, from the same household, but on his device for the same brand, he's going to see men's collections for that same brand. So just simple ways to do that too. And then finally, marketing data and analytics, always a great one. I'm a big fan of uh, machine learning for this reason and AI and kind of optimizations. I love the fact that, you know, these, the platforms are, are leveraging all of the insights of either the brand account or leveraging industry-wide insights too, based on all of the accounts that they have access to in then helping brands and companies to then predict or serve up better content for everyone. Um, so many, many different ways that these are being leveraged. Oh, my skin's, my, my screen's not visible. Sorry about that. Here you go. I did not see that. So hopefully this makes sense now, right? Machine learning and the ways that it's being applied. Um, from optimizing product and pricing, acquiring new customers, retaining existing customers, social media, and marketing data and analytics. All right, next slide. Sorry, I just went backwards. There we go. Chat GPT, big, big, big thing, um, big topic of discussion. I'm just curious, you can put it in the chat. How many of you guys have actually tried Chat GPT? Um, and how many of you guys, and what's something, I guess for those of you who have used it, what has surprised you about ChatGPT? And while you do that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. So what I find fascinating about ChatGPT is that I've seen so many different use cases for it. So some people are using it just for information, right? Information gathering, the same way that you would, again, like I mentioned, Google search something, they're going into ChatGPT and they're asking it a question. Like, what's the typical lifespan of my dog or, or like, you know, a certain dog breed or I don't know, just anything. Why is the sky blue? Right. Asking ChatGPT a bunch of questions um, so that and, and, the, and what ChatGPT would do is doing is it's taking the, the information that it has access to on the Internet, curating that to come up with an answer. Other ways that people are using ChatGPT is for content creation. And this is where I find like I find myself constantly surprised, impressed, and even a little bit scared at how smart this technology is, right? So content creation can be anything from write a caption for a social media post announcing our Black Friday Cyber Monday sale. And it'll kind of, you know, spit out maybe three to five sentences. Um, if you give it the brand, you can even say, you know, write it, write a social media post for um, Gap uh, promoting their their uh, Black Friday Cyber Monday, Monday sale and ChatGPT will write that. I've also seen it write outlines for things. I've seen it write outlines for everything from books. Um, I recently, uh, I follow someone on LinkedIn named Andrew Chen. He, he wrote uh, The Cold Start Problem. He's like a big industry startup guy and 
uh, he, he, he posted on LinkedIn recently about how it took him three years to write that book and like, just kind of like, you know, working nights, working weekends, like just kind of on his free time, putting together an outline for the book, pulling together all of the research for that book, you know, doing all that. He recently opened up ChatGPT and asked ChatGPT to basically write an outline for his existing book without actually mentioning it, right? So he said, write me a book that outlines, um, I forgot exactly, so I'm paraphrasing, but outlines the challenges that a startup might face um, upon starting. And, you know, I want it to be 10 chapters and within every chapter, give me five key points that should be featured. And within probably less than three minutes, he had an entire book outline for a book that he's already written and that he's, you know, he took three years to write and it's a bestseller and all of that. So the question becomes, if Andrew had access to chat GPT um, three years or however many years ago before he wrote this book, would his book still be a bestseller, right? And that's the part I personally am not able to answer yet because I don't know I'm not sure if what ChatGPT spits out is quite as good or even better than what a human can spit out. And I say that because I've actually had ChatGPT help me with some things. Sometimes it's kind of drafting up something that I have to write that I just don't have the the, the brain space to um, to figure out on my own. Sometimes it's you know coming up with a new idea that you know I might be stuck on, and it's been really helpful for that. When I've asked it to actually write things for me, I find that it's just not as good. Like I, I, I'm still, and maybe I'm just still so old fashioned, but I think that there's a lot to be said about the human element. That's more, it comes across as being more authentic. It comes across as being more emotional. Now, is that going to change? Probably right. Chat GPT is getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. And Howard, you're even, um, you've even mentioned it in the chat. It's getting better at such a quick rate that it is mind blowing. And so I don't know, like it's one of those things where I, I think um, I encourage everybody to experiment with it. It's free to create an account. It's pretty simple to use. Um, you can you can, you can can really put it to work for a lot of different things and, uh, and, and just kind of use that as a way to kind of learn about what AI can do for you. Um, using it for exams and papers, might be questionable. So as someone who is involved in an academic institution, I would say, please don't do that because <laughs> that would technically be cheating. Um, but using it to come up with new content that you might need or using it to, you know, to help to get initial ideas is, is a great way to do that. Yes, um, Sweeta just mentioned, very useful for research papers or synopsis, right? So helping it at, to, to, to create a foundation for written content has been Pretty, pretty quite amazing. Um, other things that it's great at, language uh, translation. So, you know, if you need to translate something from one language to another, plopping it in there, it's kind of just as good as Google Translate. Um, and then summarizing text as well. If you've got a very, very wordy document that you just don't want to, um, that you can't, that you don't want to go through, or that just seems a little too unwieldy, putting it in there and chat GPT is really great at summarizing that. So, really interesting use cases there. And um, I've even seen it create a marketing strategy, which scary enough, I have to say was pretty good. So it is, um, it's learning fast and it is, it is helping. It's a tool that it will enable us to do a lot more. It is one of those things where I think we're all wondering as marketers, is it really going to replace the human element and, or how do we as humans continue to maintain relevance in this aspect? And I would say right now, my answer today anyway, might change next week or even tomorrow, is as marketers, we drive the strategy and we drive the positioning and we control the message. So in order for you to continue to remain your relevance as a marketer, then you need to learn how to control, and I'm putting that in air quotes, you need to learn how to work with the technology so that it gives you the answers that you need. It's still technology, right? So it's the whole garbage in, garbage out um, dynamic. You need to know what questions to ask it, or you need to know what prompts to give it in order for it to be the most useful to you. And that is another reason why I do recommend you guys downloading it because um, learning how to manipulate it is going to be key to your continued success in this industry. Jasper 
AI and other kind of um, content writing AI tools are becoming more and more popular as well. Jasper, uh, platforms like Jasper are being used to create blog posts, to create product descriptions, to write bios, to create ad copy, to create social media captions. Um, it also includes generating images using AI as well. Um, this technology is typically fueling things like chatbots for any kind of customer support um, messaging. It's really helpful for image recognition too. So if you have a if you have a product or you have a picture that you're trying to find the source of, it helps with that. It's also a really useful um, personal assistant. I think someone else in the chat had mentioned, Lockheed had mentioned it's like a personal assistant, right? So what well, ChatGPT was. So Jasper is also similar in that way too. Um, what I like about Jasper and some of the other ones similar to it is that you, especially when you're writing longer, when you're asking it to write longer form content, you can control the, the tone of voice. And so it goes back to my whole um, stance on as a marketer, you're controlling the message, you're controlling the positioning. And so Jasper typically gives you two or three different options, depending on what you're prompting it to do. And so it'll write things in different ways. So there'll be like a more casual tone of voice, and then maybe a more formal tone of voice. It might use certain uh, certain types of language or keywords um, when it's creating content for you. And so as someone, as the person, as the user of this technology to prompt the, the platform, it's important that you know how you want your brand to appear and how you want that content to appear. Um, and that's ways in which you can then uh, lead the creation of content through Jasper as an AI platform. And as I'm talking to you, I'm just curious to know, like, feel free to put in the chat. If you've got other ones that you really love that are similar, put that in the chat too, because I'm sure everybody else on the webinar would appreciate those suggestions. Um, other ways that AI is popping up and being leveraged is um, through chatbots and virtual assistants. So you've seen this as a user, probably, you know, you go to someone's website, you go to their, maybe it's their social media page, like Facebook Messenger has this a lot, where there's um, chatbots that can direct you to the right person or direct you to the right department or even just answer your question for you, depending on how you are uh, interacting with it as a user. Um, so for Duolingo, which I think they do such great, such a great job in so many ways, their TikTok, by the way, is amazing. So if you don't already follow them on TikTok, please do. They're a lot of fun. But they use uh, GPT-4 so that um, folks could can, can uh, learn language. Right. So it's almost like having a personal tutor in your pocket um, prompting you to, um, you know, use specific vocabulary words that you might uh, be learning, maybe using other kind of technology. I mean, sorry, sorry other kind of uh, terminology and then um, allowing the student or the user to ask questions of the chatbot that they, they would then answer. So this is very much like having some one on one support from a language tutor that's much more personalized and much more customized. And while this is also happening too, Duolingo is also recording what, where the student might need some extra support with certain types of words, certain types of topics, and then how they can, how they can leverage that accordingly. Other um, ways in which, sorry, that these chatbots work is that it's either a rule-based where it's being set up with triggers. Like if someone says this, then we're gonna answer with that. Um, so that's traditional rule-based chatbots. AI-powered chatbots are um, being really more powered to be more personalized and offering more flexibility when it comes to interaction. So it feels like you're actually communicating with a human. Um, so more and more companies are leveraging this kind of technology for customer service reasons um, and then being able to provide a better experience overall to their users. Content. Personalization too. So similar to some of the other um, examples we talked about earlier with maybe it's email marketing personalization, um, it could be advertising personalization, it could be dynamic content types of um, use cases. Machine learning algorithms are typically monitoring a customer's behavior and then being able to serve up content based on preferences. So I played, I was playing uh, one of my Spotify playlist for you guys when you first joined the webinar. Um, and Spotify is a great example of that, right? So if you're if you're always listening to classical music, 
and you, the next time you log into Spotify, it's going to give you your, you know, your top picks for the day or, or your top hits or, you know, music that's recommended for you. So it's very similar in, in the way that, um, the way that many of us are interacting with platforms today. Voice search is another, um, another format of art artificial intelligence. I think my Google Home Assistant is way intelligent. She answers all of my questions and, um, also tracks them all. So I'm sure she, if she were really human, she might even judge me by the types of questions I ask her, but it's anything from like, what's the weather today to how much, you know, um, how far is this place that I have to drive to, to most times it's also, can my dog eat broccoli? Cause like, you know, he's like randomly has picked up some broccoli from the floor and I want to make sure that we don't have to like pull that out of his mouth. Right. So, um, using these tools to search for information, using these tools to ask questions, um, it also has helped me to entertain my kids. So I'll be like, hey, Google, tell us a funny joke or whatever. Um, also like things like that. They'll also sing you songs. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's just hilarious stuff. So Alexa, I think also is quite funny. Um, I don't have an Alexa, but I think she, uh, for my friends that do, she, she shows a lot of sass sometimes and has some attitude. So I find that to be pretty entertaining as well. Um, so that's voice search. Um, other ways that brands and companies have been leveraging this is that uh, you can you can uh, you can convert through voice search so for example you can order a pizza through your home assistants through Amazon Alexa um, and you can even reorder your favorites so if, if you're a Domino's pizza loyalist and you have the app and they already know all of your favorite toppings you can just say hey Alexa order me a large pizza for delivery tonight right and then that'll and it's all connected to your credit card and it's all connected to all sorts of things. Um, for those of you with kids, I would highly recommend putting some child safety safeguards on this, though. I, I have a friend with, uh, she's a, she's a, uh, one of my kids' uh, friend's moms, and apparently one of the kids ordered, I forgot what it was, it wasn't anything too expensive, but like he, it may have been pizza or something like that, um, when she wasn't home one day, and she was like, I can't believe they just did that, and I was like, well, they were hungry, <laughs> and you weren't home, mom, so they ordered a pizza through their Alexa. Um, they also, uh, you can also tell Alexa to do other things like make phone calls for you and add things to grocery lists and, and other stuff. So this is truly kind of very much like a virtual assistant to help you out in those ways. Um, other things when it comes to recommendations. So just like, you know, just like Spotify, um, Amazon does it too, where when you log in, uh, it's, it's tracked kind of, uh, what your tip, what you are most likely to buy, but it has also tracked what other people are doing. And so really being able to then rec uh, recommend things like when someone bought the product that you're looking at, they're also likely to buy other things to then inspire and incentivize new ideas from a marketing perspective. So it helps with things like cross-selling. It helps with things like upselling. It helps with things like increasing the average order value from every customer. Um, and it's basically your, also, you can look, think of this as a sales assistant, right? So the platform itself is functioning as a way to help you to get more, more business um, and more revenue. There's a lot of talk about how ethical this stuff is, right? And, um, and, and how, how this is being used and also what it means for the future. And so the, the eight topics that are typically covered when it comes to ethical considerations are things like whether or not AI is um, is fair. Is it is it is it biased in any way? Is it displaying a bias? Are we, as we continue to use it, programming it to be even more biased? And you know, these are these are discussion points right now. There's no straight answer. But as as folks who are in the space that are thinking about using AI or even um, using it to power your businesses, it is these are the types of things that. Um, are important to keep in mind so that you can get ahead of these things or even find solutions for them within your own within your own business. Liability, who's responsible for AI, right? So if if ChatGPT writes a paper for you, no, not I'm not going to say paper because that's a school thing. But if they write a blog post for you, and in that blog post there are three things that seem like they were facts and true, and it turns out that they weren't, and you publish that, who's responsible for that? right? Who found that information? Who authorized that information? Who approved that information? I've um, I've asked ChatGPT to tell me about myself. Like I've asked it about me, you know, like I think I, I was actually like, tell me about Sharon Lee Tony. What is she like? You know, and it came back with 90% accuracy. So it said a lot of nice things about me, which was nice, but it also said that I had worked at, I think it was Adidas 
and somewhere else. And I've never worked at those places before. I don't know where they found that information. It's not on my LinkedIn. It's not anywhere. Um, it may have just been making some assumptions because I've worked with one of my, one of our clients is Peloton. We do a lot of things with like health and wellness brands. Um, so it may have just been like connecting certain things. I, I still don't know where that information came from. But if if it could be that inaccurate with something something that could be so obvious, all, all, all it would have to do is browse through my LinkedIn, right? And actually just pick up the um, the companies that are listed, then there could be a lot of other things that are being that are being published or being created that need to be fact-checked. So liability is a question. Security, um, a question too. If if your kids can order pizza without your permission, what else can happen? using your credit card, using your personally identifiable information? And how do we protect access to information in that way? Human interaction, right? What's the risk of that? Are we going to stop talking to each other? Are we going to stop asking each other questions? Are we going to stop telling each other jokes? Like, are we only going to go to Google Home to have it tell us terrible dad jokes instead of like wanting to hear it from our own dads? But what does that look like? Employment, and this is a big one in the industry, right? whose jobs are being taken over by this? Um, is it gonna get rid of important jobs? How do we preserve um, our relevance in the industry? Wealth inequality, who benefits from AI? AI is technology driven and not everybody has access to technology in this way. Not everybody has access to Wi-Fi. Not everybody owns a device. And so the people powering the machine learning side of this, the people that are editing the answers, the people that are asking the questions are typically people of a higher socioeconomic uh, background. So really thinking through what does this mean in terms of the information that's being gathered and distributed, power and control as well, who decides how to deploy it, who says that um, certain things are okay to deploy and other things not. And then finally, robot rights. Can the AI itself suffer? Are we, you know, are we going to put ourselves in positions where, as humans, we might be abusing um, the way that we're using this technology as well? So, no questions, but just, I mean, no, no answers for that, but, but questions to be solved and resolved. Um, I have a couple of quick case studies, and then I am gonna. Um, I would like to prompt you guys actually to put some questions in the Q&A if you have any, um, so that we can allocate some time at the end to answer those. So if you have questions about this stuff, if you have questions about the program, please feel free to put them in now so that I can turn them over to some other folks to answer those for you in just a second. So here are some case studies. What's um, Where AI has really grown and made an impact is in the beauty industry. So a lot of these case studies I have for you are actually beauty related, because it's actually a lot of fun if you think about it, right? Sephora and other beauty brands are typically very experiential experience. Uh, I can't use experience again, experiential brands and experiential uh, locations. So when people are going into Sephora, they are typically trying on different colors of makeup for their skin tone, different lip shades, maybe smelling different fragrances, but it's very, very high touch from how folks are interacting with product before they make decisions. And so even five years ago, Sephora launched something called Virtual Artist, which en enables consumers to try on products virtually. So it takes a picture of you or it takes video of you and you answer a couple of questions about your skin type, your skin tone, your skin goals. And then um, it will give you recommendations based on this, but it'll also allow you to try on products by um, utilizing filters and other things that um, would, would allow you to see, you know, what a certain shade of lipstick might look like on your face, for example. Um, the chatbot got over 8 million engagements. It helped to increase mobile sales by over 20%. It reported, Sephora reported um, um, double digit increase in conversion rates for customers who tried the product on, which makes sense too, right? If you can kind of see what this lip gloss is going to look like on you before you buy it virtually, you're more likely to purchase it. And it had a 91% positive sentiment rate. So consumers really loved it. They love the fact that they could interact with technology in this way that would then um, get them excited about a product and, and have them purchase it after that. I see a hand raise, uh, or I saw one. So if you did have your hand raised, you can, you can also put your question in the chat or in, in Q&A. Um, other things, so in Southeast Asia, um, 
Sephora was seeing some differences with that though. It wasn't seeing as much customer adoption. So what it did was it took similar um, technology and it created a different way to deliver that content. It created a step-by-step -step video that talked about um, how to use this AI and, and gave, it, gave, gave people a tutorial basically on how to interact with this chat bot so that people could then try on makeup virtually. And from that, just from like a, an educational piece, they were able to see an increase in user adoption, an increase in um, the usage per user, and an increase in, in overall traffic to the virtual assistant overall. So no matter what, it's important to, to, to know that um, educating your customers on how to use AI is important. And being able to, uh, to to ensure that they're using it responsibly is also a big part of this too. So with that, that's all the content I had for you. I'm wondering if you have any questions for me. Um, Sweet, Sweeta, you have a question about Sephora usage stopping. They do still have um, VA and VR types of functionality, both on their website and in the stores. So it hasn't stopped. It's just that when they first launched it in 2018, they saw adoption kind of in the in the US area. And then when they tried to launch it in Southeast Asia, kind of noticed that it wasn't taking off in the same way. So that was kind of the main point of that um, of that case study. Any questions for me about the content before I turn this over to my colleagues to talk about the program? Okay. There is, um, as I mentioned, we're, I mean, we're still here, but we, we do have a quick feedback survey to provide to you. So we're going to put that in the chat. Um, would love to get your feedback before you guys hop off, because we always love to know um, if this was useful to you. As you know, these are free webinars. And so we take time curating this content for you and delivering it. And your feedback really matters. Um, great. I'm going to turn this over to Asifa now to tell you a little bit more about the Wharton Arlan course.